Oh, the Rock Wilder, straight instrumentals. I love it. Uh, Reeling Z, we've got the CEO joining us now. His name is Stephen Ingle Hall. Uh, Reeling Z, uh, his business was founded in the field by the 1950s. Uh, tourism and by tourism and conservation pioneers Les and um, Olive Hutchins. 60 years later, they are tourist behemoths, weapons, doing great stuff for New Zealand. Now with the borders opening back up, tourism is about to have a big kickoff. So first guest on the show for today, introducing the CEO of Real NZ, Stephen England Hall. How are you, mate? Kia ora, Robert. How are you? Good, my friend. Good, good, good. Uh, you've just had one of the largest private capital raises ever in the history of New Zealand. What great timing. So uh, for those who aren't aware, give us the quick little top line of what just went down this last week because it's super exciting for you, your company, um, New Zealand Tourism, and all of the rest of it as we open back up. Yeah, th- thanks for a bit. I mean, I guess the, the top line is that, um, you know, after two years of challenges and and navigating the kind of uncertainty of the short term, uh, we've been through a process to raise capital for Real NZ and bring on board some strategic investors and some new partners to help really position the organisation to continue to execute on its vision, which is to accelerate the world's shift to sustainable tourism by delivering our Aotearoa, New Zealand's most memorable experiences. And so bringing on board these new partners, Milford Asset Management, or Drury, Martin Dippy, um, Brendan Lindsay, and, of course, uh, John T. Edgar from the Edgar family, uh, to become part of the real NZ Fano, if you like, the shareholder Fano. That's a pretty exciting opportunity, and we're pretty excited to have them on board. You said uh, it's got some big names in there. Everyone obviously knows what they're doing. Uh, Timing-wise, you, you just said something in there which I wanted to ask. You said sustainable tourism. For those that aren't aware or don't know, what is sustainable tourism? At, at the very heart of sustainable tourism, in my view, and everyone has a slightly different opinion of this, but for me, it's about how you enrich the world. How do you give back more than you take? So to be truly sustainable, we need to be sustainable on multiple levels. Obviously, financially, economically, we have to be able to generate more returns than the money we put in. Otherwise, we just go to business. We have to make sure that we enrich the environments in which we operate, making sure that whether it's um, you know, from a conservation lens or a biodiversity lens or a you know water or air and so forth, we're making sure that we're doing the best things we can to leave the world a better place. There's also cultural sustainability, sustainability and ultimately people as well. So we want to make sure that the people that we engage with, whether they be our guests, our partners, our shareholders, <coughs> excuse me, or our communities, or even our, our, our staff, our team, we want to make sure that we are somehow enriching their lives too. So when we talk about sustainable tourism, we're talking about across that whole gambit, people, money, environment, culture. It's such a different... Uh... There's different things which you don't usually hear from sort of big corporations, or, you know, the culture, sustainability and the future and stuff. But I want to rewind it back a little bit. Last two years, we were fortunate enough, we have Paul Corney on the show, who's the incoming chief economist for the Reserve Bank. And he was basically saying, you know, in the last two years through COVID, basically one of the biggest um, sectors hit was tourism. How do you reset the what's the game plan to reset and really push forward as, as the world opens back up, the borders open up, people come flying back in? and tourism kicks back off. What does Tourism 2.0 look like, you think? Yeah, it's a great question. Look, I think the, the we're trying to avoid using the term reset when we talk about the future of tourism. And the reason for that is because there are some things that were going on in tourism or the visitor economy is probably a better way to describe it, which were actually really powerful, really good, and very good for New Zealand, our guests, New Zealand communities, and so forth. There were some elements of that industry that weren't going as well as we would like and clearly creating pressure points, you know, whether that be congestion historically around, you know, the Tongariro National Park, sorry, the Tongariro Day Walk, um, you know, Milford Sound, you know, a couple of times a year, uh, you know, the streets of Queenstown, <laughs> you know, particularly between 7.30 and 9 in the morning, people were taking the kids to work and school, as well as uh, visitors being around. There were congestion points, and of course, we know that was creating some social license tension. So I think, you know, when we think about sort of the future of tourism, I like to think about it as building the future or creating the future rather than resetting the past. Because mm. let's be honest, you can't, unless you've got a time machine, you can't go back uh, to where you were. You can only build from where you are. So I think the, the, the opportunity for New Zealand is to continue to offer absolutely world-class, you know, only in New Zealand experiences, live with absolutely phenomenal monarchy tanga, you know, a unique welcoming hospitality um, that we're quite famous for and how do we continue to do those things which are great and then ensuring that the ecosystem, the legislation, regulatory environment and of course businesses are focused on doing all those things with an eye on 
you know, making the world a better place. So I want to talk about that for a second in terms of this experience that's, that you can't get anywhere else. People have been cooped up. They want to get out and about. What have you seen in terms of data or global like insights and attention getting brought to wanting to travel and get out in the mix and actually, you know, going to these booking sites and stuff like what do you, what has the demand been looking like that you've seen from a data perspective in the last three to six months as everything's starting to open back up? Yeah, absolutely. What we've seen in markets where, uh, which are a bit ahead of New Zealand, that's a probably important point to make. You know, North America, Europe, some parts of Asia have actually been ahead of us in terms of reopening and reconnecting to the world. What they have seen is really strong uh, resurgence in bookings and and, and um, travel, and you know, particularly outbound. So from the UK to Europe or UK to America, has really uh, rebounded reasonably quickly and quite robustly. So I think we're going to see some of that here too, uh, although New Zealand's clearly a lot further away and most people probably don't appreciate or realise that it takes an awful lot of effort to get an airline to choose to fly to Auckland or Christchurch or Queenstown uh, over flying to you know Prague or Berlin or, or London. Um, and so there's a fair bit of energy required by the entire ecosystem to reconnect us to the world. But assuming that that happens and it happens smoothly, I think demand will exceed supply in terms of capacity in the short term. And then I think it will normalise over time and it will become, um, you know, we'll see, I think we're going to see a very quick, well, the next 12 months probably going to be fairly slow build and then I think we'll go through a period of, of pretty good growth and then things will normalise again, perhaps by 2025. That's what we're kind of anticipating. Uh, and in terms of customer and visitor demand, it's definitely there. New Zealand's still a very um, exciting place to put on your bucket list to go to and it's something that we've seen demand remain reasonably high from. According to the Tourism New Zealand stats that came out a couple of weeks or months or so ago, you know, interest and preference for New Zealand remains very high. Um, the question is, how are they going to get there and what's it going to look like? Yeah, interesting point you said about 25 for the rebuild. You know, COVID hits in 2020, back in action in 25. Who would have thought rewinding the clock that we'd be looking at a half a decade cycle to, to reset, you know, kind of like get the wheels back rolling again? Obviously, um, really yeah. said still a private company, not – um, uh, publicly held so that the dollars are on the stealth but you know you've got some big um, new investors that have come on board the majority is still going to be on the side with the family how what's the biggest impetus or like the prioritization for for these funds and capital that's now coming to the, to the business like where do, where's the energy going to be going to make it even better business building forward yeah i mean the, that's a great question but for us the focus uh, in the short to medium term is definitely around lifting the customer experience, we're doing everything we can in the details to make sure that we deliver the world's most memorable experiences. Part of doing that is how we use technology, data, analytics to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the work that we do, the experiences we deliver, and of course the customers that we and guests that we attract uh, and support throughout our experiences. So that's really big focus areas for us. You know, how do we lift? You know, how do we lift our experience? How do we lift the, the guest outcome? And along with that, how do we use technology and analytics and data to drive? To drive forward and make sure that we're doing, if you like, delivering these amazing experiences in the most productive way with, you know, with an eye continuously on how do we lift customer experience, how do we lift employee experience, how do we make better economic uh, and environmental decisions. You brought a, a word up which I was just about to ask you, technology. What future role or ha how has technology been like further implemented into this tourism world in, in your eyes over this last two years? How much priority has it been and what sort of shifted in the way the, the business is sort of operating in terms of integration of technologies for a more efficient company? Yeah, I can't really speak for the sector more broadly um, aside from where we've seen additional investment going in, in the terms of technology investment around tourism. Things like, you know, uh, booking technology, customer management, CRM, uh, marketing, social media intelligence, things like that have continued to receive investment around the tourism space. And, and you'd expect them would, right? Because clearly pre, pre pandemic tourism was like a seven trillion dollar economy globally. So if you're a technology provider in that ecosystem able to deliver real value and clip the ticket in the process, there's a, there's a huge amount of economic value that can be, can be created through tech. So uh, within our organisation, focusing on things like customer management, data, analytics, understanding our business more efficiently, how we do better strategic asset management, and resource planning, all that sort of stuff, which sometimes is a bit invisible to the outside world, but actually from an organisational point of view, critical to ensuring that we just become a better business. 100% agree. Before you leave, I've got one final question. What are you the most excited about in the next 12 months for the New Zealand tourism sector? What is the one thing that you are like, let's go? 
I think there's probably can I ask that two in two parts. But the one thing I'm most excited about is welcoming back international visitors to experience this incredible and remarkable part of the world. Uh, and when they get to do that, doing that in a way that's going to blow their minds and actually leave them thinking, man, this country is extraordinary and the people who live here, work here and play here are, tr- are truly amazing. So I think that's the, that's, the, that's the big exciting thing, for seeing that resurgence of international engagement and reconnecting New Zealand with the world. You know, we're, we're a trading nation, we're an exporting country, we need to be connected with the world. And I think that's an exciting, I think us being reconnected and having our voice back out there and heard more often and, and spoken about through that lens is, is a really powerful thing for pride. Uh, as well for, as for the mana of Aotearoa. Absolutely love it. Uh, Stephen, Ab, really appreciate your time. Uh, awesome uh, news on the latest uh, latest round and bring on, um, you know, tourism opening that back up to the world and busy days for everyone. Really appreciate your time, my friend. And I'll be seeing you next month down in Queenstown. Let's drink a few Pinots. Love your work, my friend. Absolutely, mate. Mm-hmm. Sounds great. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Have Champ. a good day. Cheers, brother. That was Stephen Ingen Hall, the CEO of Real NZ. Uh, one of the big players in the tourism uh, ecosystem and industry. An amazing time to be alive for New Zealand opening back up for tourism.